Thanks. We'll begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this morning. And Lord, I thank you for these students. We just pray that you be with us today. Help us to uh, glorify you in what we do. We thank you, Lord, that you love us even when we, we don't love you. We thank you that you uh, just uh, you die for our sins. And if we accept you in your heart, we know that you your sacrifice is sufficient, that we can have your righteousness instead of our own. And we just thank you for that, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. <coughs> okay, so um, I started to show you some, some Taylor series techniques last time. And so where we're going is I'm going to try to show you guys basically all of my favorite um, computational tricks for series. These may or may not be in the textbook. They probably are. But um, then um, about 10 minutes before class, I'll shift gears um, and take a homework question or three. All right, so let me just remind myself. When does class end? 8.55, all right. Yeah, yeah, he, he told me what I needed. That's good, it's cool. All right, all right. So thank you, guys. Um, <clears throat> so series calculation, let's talk about that basically. Now next week, um, in the, as we go on, I will eventually um, state theorems more carefully and we'll come back to the question of what's the domain of a power series, how do you tell where they converge and all that. I'm saving that for the next level of discussion because I think the first level of discussion ought to be how do you actually calculate with power series? All right, so first things first, if you have f of x, which is smooth, you can write f of x is equal to f of, let's say, I'm going to change notation today if you don't mind. Well, no, I guess I won't. f of c, I take that back, f prime of c times x minus c. I'm changing notation a little bit, right, because now I'm just talking about um, the function f rather than the function g, if you don't mind. Right, what is this? This is the Taylor series for f of x um, centered where x equals to c. So if you think of, conceptually, if you think of f as being a function which is given, all right, so think of here, suppose f of x is given smooth function. It's a smooth function. What does it mean to say a function smooth? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, shouldn't there be an x minus c term? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that was, that was quite a trick there. <laughs> uh, that does not, thank you. That's not, not, not encouraging for me. <laughs> uh, Yes, thank you. So watch out for my mind skipping this morning. All right, yes. Oh, fine, I gotta fix that. All right. So there's something here that I should have emphasized last time, right? And um, let me just take the opportunity to do it now. If you look at these first two terms, what is this? This is exactly the linearization, right? This is the linearization of y equals f of x, right? Near x equals to c. Or if you, if you want, you could say that's the tangent line to the graph. Well, I'm sorry, I mean, to be more precise, the graph of that expression, right, the graph of that function, which I've underlined in blue, is in fact the tangent line, right? What's the first three terms? This is the what? This is the best quadratic approximation to f of x, right? 
and then if you keep going, right, and taking higher and higher Taylor polynomials, um, by the way, this is what, what does your book call this thing? This is what he, I think he calls this one like P1, right? He calls the first three terms P2 of x, I believe, and so forth in section, what is it, 12.6? <coughs> Um, all right, so, you know, I could be more general, just for a second here, let me do that. This is the notation I like to use. I like to say the nth Taylor polynomial um, centered um, at C, which is generated by F, is the following. It's the sum k equals 0 to n of the nth, uh, excuse me, the kth derivative evaluated at C divided by k factorial times x minus c to the k power. This is the nth Taylor polynomial. Right? Then as n goes to infinity, we obtain the Taylor series, the Taylor series generated by F at C. All right. So the first Taylor polynomial is the linearization. The second Taylor polynomial is the best quadratic approximation. The third Taylor polynomial is what? It's the best cubic approximation near C. So like if I was to try to just, just take a second here to try to appreciate what's going on. If my graph, right, looks something like, let's say, like that, right? And um, this is C. I could, graph, I could graph a few Taylor polynomials. Let me do an easy one. P0, what's T0? Well, T0 is just this, right? So there's the zero Taylor polynomial. The most boring of all possible approximations. You just approximate the function near the point by its value at the point. Is this ever useful? Yes, this is very useful. We do this all the time in physics when we use f equals mg. mg is just the first term in the Taylor approximation to gmm over r squared in physics. Then the next thing up, oh, you see, this is a, this is a quirky example, isn't it? I picked a horizontal tangent. So this happens to also be equal to what? f of c plus f prime of c times x minus c, right? Because why? Because this is zero at a horizontal tangent. So it's just it's a quirk of this is this this function that I'm drawing that both the zeroth and the first Taylor polynomials actually are the same. You could always have this happen if you have a derivative going to zero. It could be that two of the different Taylor polynomials are actually the same polynomial, right? That could happen. What's next? The quadratic, right? So quadratic would look something like this. If I can fit. Something like that is T2 of x, all right? And so that <coughs> f of c plus 1 half f prime prime of c times x minus c squared, right? And uh, it should follow. It should follow the function more a little bit further, maybe. All right, I'm uh, not giving it enough credit. It, it would follow the function at least a little bit further, away from the point of tangency, probably. And then what's next? Well, next there's the the cubic approximation, right? Which would be something more like. 
could follow. Well, I don't know exactly. It's, it's going to. Something like that probably would be T3 of X. I, I wouldn't know without giving a formula and working out. Yeah. Because the first derivative is 0. Because it's a, it's a horizontal tangent, right? Just, just for this example, right? Now, OK, so set, set aside the cubic here. Let's just take a step back. What could we think about with this example? We could think about, for example, wh wh what did we, wh where did you come across this kind of uh, story in Calculus 1? Do you remember? Remember Calculus 1? Calculus 1. If we have f prime of c is equal to 0, right? And f prime prime of c is greater than 0, then what? f of c is what? Local min, right? The reason for that is explicitly in front of us if we look at the Taylor polynomials. Because locally, right, if it's a critical point, the dominant thing close to the point is this blue line, right? Um, the contributions from the cubic piece are really tiny if you're close to there. So what's dominant, what's huge, what's largest at the point of tangency, in this case the critical point, is this second order term. So if this is positive, it's like a parabola that opens up near the point. And if this is negative, it's like a parabola that opens down at the point. And that's a second derivative test, which we can understand intuitively from Taylor polynomials like this. Yeah. What if you had the first three derivatives were 0, but the fourth one was non-zero. Then what would it look like? Close to the point, it would look like a cordic, like a more sort of a steeper bowl, right? More like a kind of a, um, what are those things called in football at the end? Yeah, those ones, the field goals, like a field goal. So it would look more like that, you know? But if it was just the first thing was non-zero of the fourth order, if the fourth order is positive, it's a minimum. If it's the fourth order is negative, it's a maximum. Right? If the first thing that's non-zero is a, an odd power, then there's neither a max nor a min. You can, you can show it's a saddle. This is the generalized um, max-min test based on the uh, Taylor polynomial. Anyway, I, I wanted to just stop and talk to you about what the terms in the Taylor series mean for a minute or two. So there, there it is. Okay. With that, I turn to the next grab bag of tricks, which is geometric series techniques. <clears throat> All right, so let me show you an example. Um, let's see here. If we look at um, f of x equals to 1 over 1 plus x squared, right? Can you rewrite that as a series? Well, before I do that, what do you think the, well, OK, I, I guess I'll do it first. That's what? That's 1 over 1 minus a minus x squared, right? Can you see that? So it's, um, it's geometric, right? Well, reversing the geometric series result, I can trade this for a geometric series, right? This is actually the sum, k equals 0 to infinity of minus x squared to the k-fold power, right? So going from here to here, I'm saying a is equal to 1. The first term in the series is 1. And the ratio of this geometric series is minus x squared, right? So I need what? I need the absolute value of minus x squared to be less than 1. Make sense? Now that, that minus absolute value, this, this you can trade that, <laughs> you can trade that inequality for a more simple one. You know, I mean, this, this is basically just this, okay? If you just work it out. There are some things we must know in here. 
So <clears throat> here are the things you must know. Memorize these. First of all, the sum k equals 0 to infinity of a r to the k, which by the way is a plus a r plus a r squared and so forth. This is equal to a over 1 minus r provided what? Yeah, the, the magnitude of the ratio. So here, r is the ratio, right? r is equal to a sub k plus 1 divided by a sub k for all k, right? This is the ratio of this geometric series. So we need to know that. We need to internalize that result because we're going to use it again and again and again and again and again. All right. It's just about as important to us in what we're doing right now as is the power rule to basic differentiation. Like, it's, we're going to keep using it. So with that comment, you see what this is, right? I mean, it's just that. So, But I understand, like, you guys are still learning, and it's understandable. I'm not criticizing you for not knowing it. It's not at all what I'm trying to say. There are other things we should memorize, though. And these probably you don't have memorized yet, because we just had some yesterday, right? But how about this? e to the, e to the u is 1 plus u plus 1 half u squared plus 1 over 3 factorial u cubed plus da 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 da. In other words, it's the sum k equals 0 to infinity of u to the k divided by k factorial. That should be something that you know. You should also know the power series for cashew, since you, cosine u and sine u. These we should just know. Now, if you don't know them, but you can derive them in a reasonable time frame, all right, if it takes you 10 minutes to derive one of these, that's not 10 minutes I'm planning for you to spend on the test, right? So that wouldn't be wise. But these you also need to be able to recover fairly quickly. Um, oh, but anyway, I can... <clears throat> you can go back to yesterday and fill those out, right? Do you want me to fill them out now? I mean, I can. I guess we have time. <clears throat> 1 plus u squared over 2, right? This is u plus 1 over 3 factorial u cubed. This is 1 minus u squared over 2. This is u minus 1 over 3 factorial u cubed plus da 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 to be more complete this is the sum say j equals 0 to infinity of um, 1 over 2j factorial u to the 2j and I'll just write the last one the last one is the sum j equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the j divided by 2j plus 1 factorial u to the 2j plus 1. The formula, the general formulas for cosine and for cinch are just the same, but without the appropriate minus signs. Right? No plus, the uh, Cauch and cinch series um, formulas don't have plus or minus in them, they, for you anyway. <coughs> Of course, if you actually evaluated at u equal to a negative number, you could get plus or minus in the cosine, hyperbolic cosine or hyperbolic sine series. All right. So I got that off my chest. I mean, you need to be trying to memorize those for going forward, but it's okay if you don't know them yet. Um, all right, so this one. What is this? We can clean this up, right? Oh, man, this is a worthless marker. Ah. Missed it. So this is what? This is the sum. k equals 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the k, right, times x to the 2k. And there you go. That's the power series. This power series approximates the rational function 1 over 1 plus x squared, where? It doesn't approximate, I should say. This reproduces. 
y equals to 1 over 1 plus x squared, where it replicates it on what? Minus 1 to 1, right? What on earth is the significance of x equals to plus or minus 1 here, though? Because if you think about the graph of this, right, it's this guy, right? This is y equals to 1 over 1 plus x squared. It's x squared plus 1, rather. The denominator is never 0. The thing is largest at 0. It's 1. And then it asymptotically goes to 0 on both sides. It's rather a well-behaved function, right? The area under this curve is even finite if you go out to plus or minus infinity, right? I think the total area under the curve is what? It's like pi. Um, so, you know, for some reason, we, you know, we, we reduplicate the function with this power series just between plus or minus 1. Isn't that weird? It's kind of weird. Why is that? But it stops there. It can't follow the function beyond those points. It's weird. I mean, I totally understand why the example I showed you guys yesterday, where we had a vertical asymptote at 1, right? Remember that one? Minus 1 over x minus 1? It makes sense to me why we can't make the power series follow the function past the vertical asymptote, right? There's like a natural barrier there that we can't get past. That vertical asymptote is like, it's a game changer, right? When you go from one side of the point to the other, the formula is really different function behaves different. What happens at 1 or minus 1 here? I don't know. It's a mystery, right? This is one of the fundamental mysteries of real calculus. I'll just leave it at that. Sorry if that's unsettling, but it is a mystery, which I can't explain here. Another example. <laughs> so the point, let me just kind of reiterate what we did here. We found a power series approximation for this, I mean a power series that reproduces this function. I shouldn't say approximation. It would be an approximation if what? If instead of using the series, you used a Taylor polynomial, right? Like an, a, an, a, a Taylor approximation, a Taylor series approximation to this would be something like this. 1 plus x squared is equal to approximately, you know, 1 minus x squared plus x to the fourth for x approximately zero. Right. I mean, that's true. That quartic does a pretty good job of approximating 1 over 1 plus x squared near zero. It's only off by the remainder of the, the power series. Right? <coughs> okay, so that's great. What else can we do to this function? Let's keep playing with this one. How about if we look at the integral? of dx over 1 plus x squared. What's that give us? Very good. Yeah, inverse tangent. Plus a constant, I suppose. But here's the cool thing, guys. We can also say that that's equal to the integral of this thing. Right? Yesterday, I used a series to do an integral that we couldn't otherwise do. I am now using that same, I'm about to use that same integrate term by term theorem to discover a power series approximation of a function that I, I happen to know the integral of. So it's kind of a sneaky sideways thing I'm doing here. This is the sum, well, a constant, right? Oh, these, these, are, not, these are not erasers. These are smudgers. They're not helpful. I should not touch that stupid thing. So like C1, sum k equals 0 to infinity. We integrate term by term, right? So that's minus 1 to the k. What happens if we integrate x to the 2k? Gives you what? x to the what? 2k plus 1, right? And divide by what? I got a 2. I heard a 2. Anybody care to add to that? 2k plus 1, yes. There we go. 
That's the integral of the kth term. Minus 1 to the k is a constant. We're not integrating that per se. I mean, you don't, you're not. All right, so there you have it. Inverse tangent of x plus some constant is equal to some other constant plus this series, right? If you plug in 0 into the above, right? Let me call this thing star. Plug x equals to 0 into star, what do we get? We get c is equal to c1, right? The series um, that we have there, where does it start? What's its lowest term? When you're deciding whether or not a series, when you evaluate at 0, gives you 0, it's important to think about what's its lowest term. So this, what this looks like is, when you plug in 0, this is what? x to the 1 divided by, it's x, right? So this is x minus 1 third x cubed, and so forth, right? If I plug in 0 into that series, it's the 0 series. If I plug in 0 into inverse tangent, inverse tangent of 0 is 0, right? So consequently, c is equal to c1. And we obtain the following wonderful result. The inverse tangent of x is equal to the sum k equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k um, divided by 2k plus 1 times x to the 2k plus 1. Which, of course, when we write out terms, is like x minus a third x cubed plus 1 fifth x to the fifth minus 1 seventh x to the seventh and so forth. There's the power series, the Maclaurin series technically, um, or Taylor series centered at zero um, for the inverse tangent. Interesting? Yes, no, maybe so. <clears throat> All right, let me show you another example. <coughs> I personally don't have that memorized. I mean, there might be some instructors who would say you should have that memorized. I'm not such an instructor. I'm the instructor who thinks you should be able to derive it if I asked you to. So I might say something like, find the power series for inverse tangent using a geometric series technique. I would be referring to this example. Um, let's look at another example. How about f of x? equals to the natural log of 1 plus x. That's not directly a geometric series, right? Can you think of something we can do to that function to make it a quote unquote? When I say it's not a geometric series, I'm being a little bit glib. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of this right-hand side here, right? as being a quote unquote geometric series. I know if I can come to a rational function of the form a over 1 minus r, then I can use the geometric series result to, to convert the expression I have into a series, right? What can we do to this function to make it become a rational function for which I can apply the geometric series result? What can I do? But I, hear, I think I heard it. Differentiate, right? What happens if I differentiate? f prime of x? 1 over 1 plus x, right? Now that I can use the geometric series result for, right? This is the sum. k equals 0 to infinity minus x to the k. You see, because here we have a equals to 1 and r is equal to minus x. 
And so what I have then is that df dx is going to be the sum k equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the k times x to the k. Again, to, to, uh, to emphasize, that's df dx, right? All right, great. By the way, let me, re let me just, I have, I said it in words, but I didn't write it on the board. And I, so, sometimes you, some of you guys just write down whatever I write on the board and nothing more, which is not, not the best habit, but it's understandable. I say a lot of stuff. Um, our goal, right, what's our goal? Find Maclaurin series. For uh, f of x, okay. For the natural log of one plus x. It's like, oh man, we found the Maclaurin series for the derivative of the function. That's not what we want. I said to erase this all and start over. No, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> that would be that would not be wise. Don't erase this because this is almost what we want. How do you undo a derivative? Integrate, Integrate right? So f of x is equal to some constant plus the integral of df dx dx, right? And I say some constant because, well, anyway, here we go. So this is some constant plus the, um, so, you know, integral of that series. So I trade the uh, derivative for its series. And of course, integrating a series will give me yet another power series. So this is c plus the sum k equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k, x to the k plus 1 over k plus 1. We need to figure out what this constant should be, right? How do we figure that out? First of all, I want to think about what is this series, actually? Where does it start? k equals 0 gives me what? What's k equals 0 in this formula? Is it just x? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right, x. What's, x? What's k equals 2, then? k equals 1, it goes 0 and then 1. I can't count. Let me not skip the 1. So at k equals 1, you get what? Minus x squared 2. All right. Who cares? All right. Now plug in x. Now on the other hand, this is what? This is the natural log of 1 plus x, right? So set x equals to 0, we get f of x, f of 0 is natural log of 1, which is equal to 0, but that should also be equal to c, right? So in other words, we see from evaluating our given function at 0, its value at 0 is the natural log of 1, which is 0. Consequently, this constant of integration must also be 0. Make sense? I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I mean, it just so happened that the constant didn't play an interesting role in either of the last two examples, but it can in general. So it's important not to ignore the issue that this constant is here in the integration. All right? So anyway, but there we go. The natural log of 1 plus x is equal to the sum k equals to 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k over k plus 1, x to the k plus 1. <coughs> now, what range of x, what domain of x do we know that this formula makes sense for? I guess you don't know because we haven't stated the theorems carefully, but um, I mean, for sure, this geometric series was good for what? We need the absolute value of x to be less than 1, right? In other words, for minus 1 less than x less than 1 in this case. 
And it so happens that when you integrate, when you integrate a series, you may or may not, um, well, I think you, you usually tend to, you end, end up sometimes adding endpoints. Um, This is actually true. This is true for x an element as it happens of, let's see here, um, minus 1 not included to 1 included. We have not done the analysis to justify all that just yet. But you can see why 1 should be included. What happens when you plug in 1? Plug in 1 to the Try setting x equals to 1 in this formula we just found. What happens? What do you get for the series? What, what kind of series is that if you plug in 1? In other words, that's 1 minus a half plus a third, and so forth, A. So, quiet. Shush. I'll finish this thought, and then we'll go to your homework. So that's an alternating series, right? This is the alternating harmonic series. It converges. We, we proved this converges the other day, right? And why does it converge to what it, I told you it converged to the natural log of 2, didn't I? Do you see why that's true? Put x equal to 1. Natural log of 2 equals that. That's how I knew that. There are more tricks to teach you guys. I'll probably spend all of Monday. Well, maybe not. I probably won't do anything Monday, right? Okay. Anyway, there is, of course, more, more to learn. Anyway, you guys can ask me questions about your homework now. I'll shut up. So. Although you'll have to really explain the problem to me because I have stupidly left my book. Now I need to find an eraser, which is actually an eraser. Maybe this one. Questionable. Oh, man. Look at this mess. Ugh. Eraser is a joke. If you're going to leave these erasers sitting here, you might as well not clean the board. <laughs> it's like... I don't know. It's like, it's like leaving a grenade in a... A playground for children or something. It's it's not appropriate. Uh, is that uh, maybe that's an example of hyperbole, I believe. Um, see here, so you guys have questions. Oh, question. Um, number twelve. Um, twelve point four. Uh huh. Dial it back there for a second. 2k plus what? It's not t squared. Oh, 2 times k? Yeah. Plus? Uh huh. Over k to the third plus the square root of k. Okay. All right. Let's see here. And this is one of those. All right, so, you know, guys, one of the things I should try to impart to you is. When we're looking at some new problem, right, you want to try to think about <coughs> can you get some kind of intuitive idea about what this is essentially looking like, right? So if I think about k being very large, right, essentially what, what wins in the numerator is k, right? What wins in the denominator is k cubed. So, like, essentially, after a while, this looks like 2k over k cubed. So what I'm trying to tell you is this is like a really twisted p equals 2 series. So my intuition is that this converges, all right? 
I've decided it converges. Is it geometric? I mean, well, I mean, <clears throat> obviously it's not geometric, right? Telescoping, I don't think so. Um, which page did you say that was really nice? Page 596, we should all read the paragraph on page 596. Thomas has encouraged us to read the paragraph on page 596. It gives a nice overarching um, few sentences that give you kind of guides for how to go forward. forward. I'm, I'm going to try to give you some kind of like big picture of, of how to think about these things, but all my advice falls short somewhere. I mean, there's just too many cases to encapsulate with any simple heuristic. That said, I think it's a, like a P equals two series, right? So I should either try direct comparison to P equals two maybe, or I think I like limit comparison for this problem, yeah? So if we try limit comparison, let's try to use limit comparison. So let's say this thing is A sub K, right? To um, B sub K equals to one over K squared. So I'm supposed to look at A sub K over B sub K. And if that converges to a positive number, right, then the limit comparison says that um, A sub K, the series for, with terms A sub K also converges because the P equals 2 series is known to converge, right? So this is what? This is um, 2K plus root K over K cubed plus root K, right? Um, times what? Times 1 over 1 over k squared, like that, I suppose. If I want to write it ugly. Huh. Well, that's not too bad. So what's that do? That gives me like a 2k plus the square root of k, right? Divided by k plus what? What's, what's root k over k squared? k to the what? minus three halves, right? Now how should you how should you attack a problem like that? What do you want to do? This goes back to like day one for sequential limits. This is just we can we can solve this one with an algebra approach, right? No. Because I'm dividing by k squared down here. So then what I, I think if I do, I mean, let me try something, see if it works or not, okay? If I divide the top and the bottom by k, what do I get? I get 2 plus k to the minus 1 half over 1 plus k to the minus 5 halves. Let me rewrite that more suggestively. This is 2 plus 1 over the square root of k, right? Divided by 1 plus 1 over the square root of k to the fifth. Did I do something wrong? I mean, it's totally possible. <laughs> what happens as k goes to infinity? Right, those, those go to 0, and this whole thing goes to what? Goes to 2, right? And that's what I need to apply the limit comparison, right? We need that the, the ratio of the, the series, the terms in the series we're comparing, has to go to a finite positive value, right? That's good. I mean, I could write more to give you a complete solution, but I think I'm going to go on to the next problem now. Yeah. Could you also just do the interval test on what you were comparing it to? You see it here? No. Well, we already we, we know. Um, You know, yes, yes, I mean, that is true by the integral test, right? But we don't need to recreate the, uh, um, we, are, we already did that. We, we, we don't have to do that again in this problem. Well, the, okay, so limit comparison test, what does it say? Limit comparison, what does it say? Limit comparison test it says that the sum of a sub k Oh, it says that if a sub k over b sub k goes to L, all right, a positive real number, 
um, as k goes to infinity, then the series with terms a sub k converges if and only if the series with terms b sub k converges. Now, there is a little bit more fine print here. We have to be looking at series with positive terms, right? But these are series with positive terms, so we're good to go there. So I'm using, I mean, I'm saying you, you can use the limit comparison. We look at the quotient of the terms in these two series you want to compare. We can show that they go to two. Consequently, this series converges because the p equals two series is known to converge. Again, the reason I started with all this, though, is, is my intuition was that asymptotically this thing behaves like a p equals 2 series. That's why I compared it to it. And I also thought direct comparison, oh, I mean, or basic comparison test just doesn't seem like fun here. I don't know. Maybe it would be. Can you guys do the direct basic comparison test here, too? You might be able to. Yeah, you probably could do that, too. If you don't like this, you could also do this, 2k plus root k over k cubed plus root k, right? Um, this is less than or equal to. How can I make the denominator smaller? I mean, pick, pick your poison. I'm going to pick the root. Right? I made the denominator smaller. But of course, this, <laughs> this is equal to 2 over k squared plus 1 over k to the what? Five halves, yeah? And these, if you, by the way, the sum of 2 over k squared and the sum of 1 over k to the 5 halves, this is p equals to 2, this is p equals to 5 halves, roughly speaking. I mean, I'm abusing language a little bit because there's a 2 there. But it's essentially a p equals 2 series. Those converge. So you have a series that is larger term by term than your given series, which converges. Consequently, it converges by the basic comparison test. That's another way you could argue, if you don't like limit comparison. Well, that, that's also fine. Totally fine. You could do that. <coughs> Sorry, there's a, there's a line here. Well, I'll, I'll take some more questions from the next section. Is there any particular one you guys want me to try to answer over there? I can, you can put in a request. Um, I found 12.4 number 26. And what? Yeah, okay. 12.5 number 26? It's number 26. It's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Not really that funny. <coughs> What's wrong with me? Ah. Mm. 